This uniform belonged to Helmut Canola. He was one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Like him, thousands of witnesses were thrown into Nazi prisons and camps for what they believed. A small number, compared with the millions exterminated by Nazi terror. Yet nearly 2,000 witnesses died, more than 250 by execution. From the start of the Nazi regime, this small Christian group were brutally assaulted, but not silenced. They let the world know that the Nazi killing machine was engulfing not only them, but Jews, Poles, and others. The history of Jehovah's Witnesses, how they stood firm in their beliefs, and how they spoke out, is a record few have heard about today. It is a story that must be told. I'd like to welcome you to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. It is both a privilege and an honor to have you as our guests today because your story is an extremely important one. And I'd like On September 29th, 1994, historians from Germany, Britain, and the United States spoke about Jehovah's Witnesses. Together with survivors and representatives of the Watchtower Society, they revealed remarkable details. Draft and they wouldn't utter the word Heil Hitler. And it's very intriguing to feel the social dissident character of that when you walk into a room and you hear the words Heil Hitler and somebody says good morning. Or you walk into a room and the meeting is concluded and you say Heil Hitler and somebody says Oh Wiedersehen and that's an act of singular civic courage and of unimaginable human decency. Persecution Dr. Detlef Gaba and Wolf Brebeck are directors of concentration camp memorials in Germany. They explained why the stand of Jehovah's Witnesses was unique. Willy Paul was one of more than 20 survivors present for the seminar. He and James Belacher represented the Watchtower Society. They explained the reasons for the bold stand taken by the Witnesses. Even before the Nazis took power, Watchtower publications warned of the danger. In 1929, this bold statement was published in the German edition of the Golden Age. National Socialism is a movement that is acting directly in the service of man's enemy, the devil. And Professor Christine King, Vice Chancellor of Staffordshire University, analyzed the moral battle waged between the witnesses and the Nazis. And stand firm, indeed, the witnesses did, as we know, to death. And not a simple death, but a horrific death by torture. One of the SS guards said of witnesses singing hymns in the death cell, I could run a steamroller over you lot, and it wouldn't quiet you. They think that a steamroller will silence faith and integrity and courage and the family belief that Jehovah's Witnesses have. And of course it cannot under any circumstances. They spoke out from the beginning, they spoke out with one voice, and they spoke out with a tremendous courage. Germany struggles to recover from its World War I wounds. Ah, 
Well known as Bibelforscher, or Bible students, before 1931, Jehovah's Witnesses offer comfort and hope, but also warn of rising militarism. They are a familiar sight on streets and doorsteps, distributing tremendous amounts of Bible literature. And God's command to all such true Christians is that they must tell the truth that the people of goodwill. In Magdeburg, at a watchtower plant called Bethel, a million copies of the magazine The Golden Age rolled off the presses each month. The Magdeburg factory turned out two million books and five million booklets each year. This publishing and preaching did not go unnoticed by the growing Nazi movement. There was talk about Jehovah's Witnesses because of things that were repulsive to the National Socialists. They were talked about because they refused military service and because they did not give allegiance to the fatherland as a German ought to, according to the National Socialists. The Nazis falsely branded Jehovah's Witnesses as communists, menaces to the state, conspirators with the Jews to take over the world. By 1933, the stage was set for battle. The seeds that set in motion the rise of Nazism were sown on the battlefields of World War I. In 1914, the German armies, the French armies, the Russian armies, the English armies, all went to war. And all of their church people proclaimed that God was on their side. Nothing did the church more harm than this mutually exclusive claim to have divine support. By 1918, the cynicism, the skepticism about the church's credibility was so great that the vast majority of those who served in the trenches came back thoroughly disillusioned and no longer willing to accept the moral authority of a church which had misled them so badly. These are the young men who emerged from the trenches, who 15 years later are the leading figures in the Nazi party. On January 30th, 1933, Adolf Hitler comes to power. Appointed Chancellor by President von Hindenburg. Hopes run high for a strong new Germany. The majority of people are inspired by propaganda or by the people around them. It's perhaps not out of wickedness, but they are just swept along by a river of propaganda. propaganda. The Reichstag building, the seat of the German parliament, burns. The Nazis immediately blame the communists, and Hitler pressures President von Hindenburg to issue an emergency decree. The enabling act soon follows. Hitler, now with dictatorial powers, suspends human rights. Anyone could be arrested and imprisoned without trial. The Nazis now have a weapon to silence their enemies. In one German state after another, the police shut down meetings of the witnesses and prohibit their door-to-door -door preaching. So, the witnesses launched a campaign to inform the German government that they were not subversives. Right from the very beginning, the Jehovah's Witnesses were very clear in their position, their stance, and they kept their position of political neutrality. In the early days, there were attempts to explain to the authorities what this means, and that, in fact, it wasn't a political threat. Representing the 25,000 Witnesses in Germany, delegates from all over the country gather for a convention in Berlin to adopt a resolution. 
Und in dieser Erklärung legten wir da In this declaration we explained that we had absolutely no political goals that our activity was purely religious and that we wished to make use of the freedom of belief and of religion in accordance with the promise made in the party platform and also by government officials and that therefore this matter of partial bans should be investigated and they should be lifted the country was blanketed with more than two million copies of the declaration. Konrad Franke shared in the distribution. He was arrested and sent to the Osthoven labor camp. There was to be no place in this new Germany for Bible student ideas, for the religious teachings of Jehovah's Witnesses. Prussia issued a second ban of Jehovah's Witnesses. The police were ordered to shut them down again. Um, 28. On June 28, here a band of 30 stormtroopers, Hitler's brown shirts, forced their way in and occupied the premises. A ban was declared. When this building was closed, we no longer had a central office, but were forced to go underground. This is the last German issue of the Watchtower printed in Magdeburg. The presses fall silent. A few weeks later, the Nazis return. Twenty-five truckloads of Bible literature are carted off to the Magdeburg city limits and burned. Put in relative terms, the murder of six million Jews as a crime by the state, carried out with factory-like precision, was certainly an occurrence without equal in the history of mankind. But there was also something distinctive about the persecution of Jehovah's Witnesses. They were persecuted with very great severity and brutality. The goal was to destroy this religious group. There were to be no more witnesses in Germany. From an early date, the witnesses are identified as a key enemy, partly because of their very public stance and their very public refusal to accept even the smallest elements of National Socialism which didn't fit their, their faith and their beliefs. Hitler gave the people jobs. He restored their faith in the fatherland. He is hailed as their savior. But the witnesses could not give to a man what they believed belonged to God. Thus, a battle line was drawn over a simple greeting, Heil Hitler. Jehovah's Witnesses refused to say Heil Hitler because it meant salvation comes from Hitler. At his job in a steel mill, one witness faced this test. I was the only one among 2,000 who did not raise my hand and did not return the German salute every day running the gauntlet since I was required to give the German salute and I simply said good day. Whoever did not do so attracted the fury of the National Socialists. At first there were nasty words, sometimes a beating, but soon enough it led to the first arrests. In 1934, secret witness reports smuggled out of Germany revealed disturbing facts. About 4,000 house searches have been carried out, 1,000 arrests made, of which some 400 have been sent to concentration camps, and roughly 200 cases of ill treatment occurred. Each blow was accompanied by the words, Do you still believe in Jehovah? Nazi intimidation affected not only the witnesses' religious life, but also their livelihood. 
Before they were directly arrested and sentenced by the special courts to imprisonment and later to protective custody, they had already suffered under economic and social sanctions. The loss of their jobs, their businesses were boycotted, or their pensions or unemployment money was confiscated. A typical letter of dismissal said, Following your refusal to use the German greeting, your contract of employment is terminated. Yes, I lost my job, and here I was. Now we had a lot of time for preaching. Children were drawn into the battle. Six-year-old Paul Gerhard Kusserow, like other witness children, was pressured by students and teachers. As soon as I entered school, the head teacher and the pupils confronted me and tried to make me say Heil Hitler, to salute the flag and to sing Nazi songs. Going to school was not nice, since one never knew what would happen. More than 800 children were taken away from their witness parents by the Gestapo. Paul Gerhardt, along with his brother and sister, was placed in a Nazi school. Three years under ban, and the witnesses are still active. The Gestapo have to mobilize a special unit to hunt them down. A confidential Gestapo report boasted that in just one sweep, they arrested 120 witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses were amongst the first of the prisoners to go into Dachau, which was the first, the so-called model concentration camp, and into the labor camps. And I have evidence of that in 1934, and certainly by 1935. From 1935 onward, very many Jehovah's Witnesses were in national socialist prisons and camps. Pre-war, about 5 to 10 percent of concentration camp inmates were Jehovah's Witnesses. Apart from the concentration camps, there were Jehovah's Witnesses in almost all prisons. Of my family of eight persons, six were in detention. Four brothers, one sister and my mother. Together we spent about 43 years in detention. From 1937 on, witnesses released from prison were sent directly to concentration camps. By the end of that year, 6,000 witnesses were in Nazi prisons and camps. Starting in 1937, Jehovah's Witnesses were given a purple triangle as a sign. Jehovah's Witnesses were the only religious group that made up a separate category of inmates. And the triangle was relatively big, so that a person must have been able to see it from quite a distance, and the color also, the stigma of the prisoner's category. Whenever I saw a prisoner with a purple triangle, then I knew for sure this is his sister. It helped me to recognize that this is one of Jehovah's Witnesses. The Jehovah's Witnesses received especially severe treatment from the SS because they put up such great resistance, because in their conduct they displayed much resistance. Upon arrival, I was beaten into unconsciousness in the political section. When I came to, I could spit out my teeth. I would not even have survived the first night if Brother Erich Nikolajczyk, who was next to me in bed, had not taken me into his arms and warmed me with his own body so that I recovered somewhat.
The Bible students were the very first among the very first women who came here from other camps, from the concentration camp Moringen am Solau and especially from Lichtenburg near Torgau. The first arrivals here at Ravensbrück in May 1939 were, contrary to what was believed until now, not mainly political prisoners, but as we now know, mostly Bible students. The Nazis, obsessed with breaking the witnesses' stubborn commitment, stepped up the psychological assault and made them an extraordinary offer. Each witness could buy his freedom for a price, his signature and his faith. Witnesses in prisons and camps were repeatedly handed a piece of paper and a pen. Very few signed. When I was to be released from prison, I was given a paper to sign. It required that I give up my faith and recognize the German government as the highest authority, place myself under the Hitler government and consider the Bible as a false doctrine. I said, that's out of the question. Madame Genevieve de Gaulle, a niece of General Charles de Gaulle, was imprisoned by the Nazis in 1944 as a member of the French resistance. In Ravensbrück, she met Jehovah's Witnesses. By the time she arrived at the camp, many had been captive for 10 years. What I admired a lot in them was they could have left a tiny time just by signing a renunciation of their faith. Ultimately, these women, who appeared to be so weak and worn out, were stronger than the SS, who had power and all the means at their disposal. They had their strength and it was their willpower that no one could beat. Many witness couples were separated for years, like Heinrich and Anna Dickmann. When they discovered that they were both in the Ravensbrück camp, they risked their lives just to see each other. From Buchenwald, I was put in the camp where Anna was. And there is where I had the chance to see my wife again after seven years. She had to bring laundry for the SS to the main gate, and I had to pick it up there. And so we had the chance to see each other after seven years, but without a word. Since they were standing in the guard tower watching, they would have hanged us both. The position of the Jehovah's Witnesses is a unique position of Christians, of all Christians of all kinds in Nazi Germany. It stands by itself. People living in Germany knew who the Jehovah's Witnesses were and knew what they stood for. Totalitarian rule is the product of Satan. God From the beginning, Jehovah's Witnesses and their publications spoke out against Nazi aggression. In the English language golden age, blunt editorial cartoons expose the spreading cancer of Nazism. In 1934, the Golden Age carried a stinging expose of the Nazi crackdown on the witnesses, including raids, arrests and sentences to concentration camps. The 1934 Basel Convention marked a turning point for the witnesses. Plans were set for a worldwide protest directly to Hitler on October 7th. German witnesses met in secret. On that day, at 9 o'clock in the morning, all of Jehovah's Witnesses congregated together in small groups. Jehovah's Witnesses all over the world would send a telegram to the Hitler government. Your ill treatment of Jehovah's Witnesses shocks all good people of earth and dishonors God's name. Refrain from further persecuting Jehovah's Witnesses. Otherwise, God will destroy you and your national party. Hitler did not budge, but he did react. In a sworn statement, 
government official Karl Wittig described Hitler's rage. He screamed, this brood will be exterminated in Germany. A steady stream of watchtower literature continued to flow into Germany. The Gestapo tightened the net, making more arrests. Whenever the Nazis smashed an underground organization, another quickly filled the breach. The Gestapo reckoned that every time they arrested a group, we were completely finished. They were utterly mistaken. But right up until the end of the war, the watchtower was being distributed all over Germany. The 1936 Summer Olympic Games in Berlin. Nazi Germany is on display at its best. But it is only a front. Right on the heels of the Olympic Games, the witnesses launch a campaign to reveal the ugly face of the Nazi regime. Nazi persecution is exposed in a convention resolution adopted at Lucerne, Switzerland. 200,000 copies of the Lucerne Resolution are distributed in Germany on one December night in 1936. March 1938, Hitler's troops cross the Austrian border. Soon, the witnesses would be forced underground in country after country. Key organizers, Erich Frost, Arthur Winkler, and others, put their lives on the line for their fellow believers as they try to keep one step ahead of the Gestapo. At night, in a small apartment, we shut off the windows with blankets, put quilts on the table and the machines on the quilts, so that the noise would not be heard. It was here that the watchtowers were translated and reproduced. Afterwards, we had to dismantle and hide everything, because if the Germans had found any of the equipment, it would have meant the death of whoever the material belonged to. Another conduit for smuggling literature into Germany was a Finnish doctor, Felix Kersten, Himmler's personal physician. Kersten's estate, Hartzwalder, was near Ravensbrück. He used his connections with Himmler to get prisoners to work on his farm. Then, through Himmler, Dr. Kersten tried to obtain some Jehovah's Witnesses. And he was able to, because Himmler did a lot for Kersten. Kersten took prisoner Annie Gustafsson to his home in Sweden as a maid. There, she could obtain the watchtower freely. Kersten offered to carry literature secretly to his witness workers at Hartzwalde. The magazines were smuggled between Hartzwalde and the nearby camps, Sachsenhausen and Ravensbrück. Thus, the birth of another communication network. The book, Crusade Against Christianity, was published in German, French, and Polish. This 1938 witness expose included diagrams of concentration camps and first-hand reports of cruel mistreatment of the witnesses in Germany, as documented by the Swiss Watchtower Office. Nobel Prize winner Dr. Thomas Munn wrote, You have done your duty in publishing this book and bringing these facts to light. It seems to me that there is no greater appeal to the world's conscience. On October 2nd, 1938, 50 radio stations around the world carried Watchtower President Rutherford's lecture, Fascism or Freedom. He spoke out against the vicious attacks on the Jews. In Germany, the common people are peace-loving. The devil has put his representative Hitler in control, a man who is of unsound mind, cruel, malicious, and rude, and who acts in utter disregard of the liberties of the people. Together, 
With his backers, he rules with an iron hand. He cruelly persecutes the Jews because they were once Jehovah's covenant people and bore the name of Jehovah and because Christ Jesus was a Jew. Just one month later, Nazi hatred for the Jews would explode in all its ugliness. On November 10, 1938, I came to work here early in the morning and we were surprised. All of the shops had been destroyed, the windows had been smashed, glass was scattered all over the street, everyone was walking on glass. It was the morning after Kristallnacht. Kristallnacht was a Nazi campaign whereby all Jewish businesses throughout Germany were destroyed, also Jewish offices. Everything was ruined. November 9, 1938, came the massive destruction of, of Judaism, an end to German Judaism when almost all the synagogues in Germany were burned down overnight. And the night of Kristallnacht, 20,000 Jews were arrested and sent to concentration camps in Germany. As the sinister Nazi intent toward the Jews became clear, how would the religious community react as churches and as individuals? The fact of the matter is that the middle-of-the-road Christians were deeply influenced by the waves of Nazi propaganda. So when the Crystal Knight pogrom takes place in November 1938, that's shocking and very visible evidence of Nazi anti-Semitism, the churches were totally silent. Not a few representatives of the churches called publicly for a hatred of the Jews. Such a situation was definitely not the case among Jehovah's Witnesses. Anti-Semitism carries characteristics of racism. And the last thing Jehovah's Witnesses would do was to regard the Jews as being of less merit simply because of their origin. For them, all persons were of the same merit were equal. The hundreds of Jehovah's Witnesses in the camps began to see a large influx of Jewish prisoners. The magazine Consolation asked, how can one remain silent? What if the Lutheran Church had acted the way the Witnesses had acted? What if the Catholics had? Now, in my opinion, the whole history would have been very different. I've never met or heard a survivor who does not remember the witnesses, and they all say similar things. Very small group of people, very clearly identified. They'll talk about the purple triangle that they wore on their prison uniform. They will talk about the way they shared food and care for each other, and they will talk about how they were willing to talk with, help and support other prisoners. It really appears to have stuck in people's minds. Max Liebster was arrested and sent to Sachsenhausen for being a Jew. He and the other prisoners were warned repeatedly not to speak to Jehovah's Witnesses. There were around 400 Jehovah's Witnesses in Sachsenhausen. As soon as young German witnesses arrived, they were given 25 strokes. They were locked away, surrounded by barbed wire. And the camp commander often announced that anyone speaking to Jehovah's Witnesses would be punished with 25 strokes. The main reason why the SS isolated the Witnesses from other inmates was so that they should have no opportunity to influence their fellow prisoners by spreading their faith. Literature was also miniaturized to make it easy to hide. For instance, there was a matchbook size edition of the 1934 publication Jehovah. This miniature Bible, that is the entire Bible, that was the most precious thing that I had. Amazingly, Wevelsberg camp itself becomes a source of Bible literature after a major underground printing operation is finally discovered and shut down by the Nazis in April 1943. Its organizer, Ulias Engelhardt, is arrested and beheaded. The witness prisoners in Wevelsberg camp 
picked up the slack by setting up a secret printery right under the noses of the SS guards. Had they been discovered, they would have been sentenced to death straight away. We know that they procured a typewriter. With the typewriter, they made stencils to use on a duplicating machine built with smuggled parts. We did the duplicating in the dormitory. Work on the typewriter was done using a silencer. Marx, who was the camp electrician, rigged up a warning light to alert them if the guards approached. The prisoners printed enough literature to supply witnesses in northwest Germany. September 1st, 1939. German army forces invade Poland. The world begins its bloody plunge into total war. The Nazi government has no tolerance for conscientious objectors. Heinrich Dickmann and his brother August were in Sachsenhausen. The SS tried a new pressure tactic on the witnesses. Soon after the war broke out, on September 1st, we Jehovah's Witnesses had to assemble at the entrance. August Dickmann had refused to perform military service, and Baranowski, the commander whose nickname was Foursquare, asked Himmler to confirm the death sentence. That came through, and the prisoners built a huge wall for the bullets. The whole camp was assembled. I just want to mention that the commander delivered a talk before the shooting. His microphone was standing about there. I can clearly remember one sentence when he said, the prisoner August Dickmann does not regard himself a citizen of the German Reich, but rather a citizen of the Kingdom of God. Suddenly, a member of the SS came from between the barracks with August Dickmann and led him to the wall. August was standing at the front and we 300, about 300 brothers, were standing at the most eight or ten paces away from him. He had to stand with his face to the wall and there were seven members of the SS. An officer with the rank of Sturmbannführer, that is with four stars, gave the order to shoot. When the shots were fired, he fell straight to the ground, and the SS officer drew his pistol and gave him the coup de grace, as was the custom. August was lying there, and the commander comes. Okay, he says, whoever signs can go home immediately, and whoever does not sign will soon be lying next to him. Two brothers suddenly stepped forward. No, they said, we don't want to sign. We already signed. Now we want to withdraw our signatures. Then I had to go to Foursquare. So, he says, what have you learned? I said, I am and I remain one of Jehovah's Witnesses. You'll be the next one to be shot, he said. Well, five months later he was dead and I am still alive. Pressure was also put on female witness prisoners to support the war effort. A large number of witness women worked in a sewing room in Ravensbrück. One day during the severe winter of 1939, 400 witnesses were confronted with a choice. We went outside and the commander came, held up his hand and said, whoever will not sew these bags for our soldiers, step aside. 
He had hardly finished speaking when the whole column stepped aside. The punishment? Five days standing in the cold without moving. At night, the 400 slept on the frigid floor of the punishment block. At the end of the fifth day, they were locked up and put on starvation rations. Yes, we sang through it all, we quoted Bible texts to each other until we grew so weak that we just lay on the floor. No straw, no blankets. And then Himmler came to take a look at his victims. You're having a bad time, but we are fine. Can't you see yet your God has abandoned you? We could do whatever we want to. And then we answered him, the God whom we are serving can save us. And even if he doesn't, we will still not serve you. Then the door was closed and he personally introduced beating as a punishment. Waltraud Kusero was taken to a factory near the Oberem's camp. She was shown a huge drawing board for designing bombs. I said, no, I can draw flowers and landscapes, but nothing of this sort. I went on to explain to them that two of my brothers had been executed because they refused to take up arms. And now I should make these arms? No, I cannot do that. At Wewelsburg, the solidarity of the witnesses made the difference for 26 of them who were doomed to death by hard labor. The 26 had refused military service. The SS wanted them dead. They were beaten and driven by the Kapos, as well as by SS personnel who were sent there and by other prisoners who allowed themselves to be used for that purpose. During the work some collapsed under the load of heavy stones, only to be forced to get back up again. The weakest of the 26 now became the sole target. He had to push a wheelbarrow full of stones, very heavy, in a circle around the courtyard until he collapsed. The other prisoners were made to pour water over him till he revived. Then the ordeal was repeated. After the third time, the prisoner did not get up. The commander, assuming he was near death, kicked him up against the barracks wall. As soon as the lights went out during the night, we were able to pull him by his legs out of sight of the guards, rubbed him until he was warm and gave him something to eat. The next morning, he was standing in line again. Not one of them died. Protestant church leader Martin Niemöller, once a prisoner himself, paid tribute to the witnesses in a sermon. The Bibelforscher by the hundreds and thousands have gone into concentration camps and died because they refused to serve in war and declined to fire on human beings. From 1939 to 1941, the SS raged against Jehovah's Witnesses with unimaginable cruelty. They employed every form of torture and torment against them so as to break Jehovah's Witnesses. Often during the winter of 1940 to 1941, they were put soaking wet out in the cold at 10 to 15 degrees below freezing. Many Jehovah's Witnesses in concentration camps did not survive this misery. To take just one example of this, within a six-month period in 1939 to 1940, in the Sachsenhausen concentration camp, every third Bible student inmate, every third Jehovah's Witness, lost his life. Another SS torture method was the hanging stake. 
Gertrude's husband, Martin, had experienced it and described it to her. Man band ihm die Hände. His hands were tied behind his back and the person stood on a platform until he was fastened backwards onto the stake. And then the platform was taken away, so that the whole body fell forward, hands folded behind the back, and that for a whole hour. With the nation at war, the death sentence became official Nazi policy in military courts. What became especially dangerous for them was that they refused military service, because after the war began in 1939, that meant they could be condemned to death. Based on the article of faith that Jehovah's Witnesses want to obey God more than men, they follow the command of neutrality. My father was executed in 1939 after he had been called up for military service and explained his standpoint on December 7, 1939. Later, in March 1942, my brother, he was 21 years old, also was executed for refusing military service. At Brandenburg prison, the lives of 2,743 men were cut short. Passing through a metal door, they came face to face with a guillotine's blade or a hanging hook. There were 32 Jehovah's Witnesses among these. I'll name just one. For instance, Wolfgang Cusero. Wolfgang Cusero, a young man who stuck resolutely to his convictions and did not give in. He met his death here fearlessly, in the absolute conviction of having behaved properly in this life. A prison guard told Josef Neklash that there was something different about the way witnesses face death. Well, other prisoners resist. Some even screamed. You could hear them screaming. But, he said, your people go to the gallows, talking about God's kingdom, up to the last moment. Horst Schmidt was among more than 250 Jehovah's Witnesses sentenced to death. He was sitting in a death cell at Brandenburg with two other men awaiting execution. We heard a very loud clattering noise, the clattering of keys. And doors were opened and slammed shut. The guard opened their cell door. He called the first man out. Then the guard looked at his list once more and read out the name of the other and said again, step outside. Well, you think, of course, it's my turn now. And he looked at his list, and then he looked at me, and then the door closed. Then, of course, you just collapse. That's obvious. Horst Schmidt escaped the guillotine. His foster mother, Emmy Zayden, did not. She was imprisoned in Berlin Plötzensee for concealing Horst and two other conscientious objectors. On June 9th, 1944, she was beheaded. A street just outside the prison has been named in her honor. of the war had turned. The fall of the Third Reich was within sight. The sounds of distant artillery fire raised hopes among the prisoners that freedom was near. But with the Nazi front on the verge of collapse, the SS tried to empty the camps and force the prisoners to march west and south. Josef Schoen was on the death march to Dachau. 
They were with the rifles hitting the doors, step out, step out. And that was the beginning of a death march. And they said to us, you will none, none of you will be turned over to the enemies. That means they will finish us off before everyone who grew weak was shot. A stone commemorates the site of another death march. Along with thousands of others, 220 witnesses were forced out of Sachsenhausen. This was not the only death march. There were several others. In late April 1945, a handful of Jehovah's Witnesses from the Stutthof camp in the eastern part of Germany, together with other prisoners, were forced onto a small barge to cross the Baltic Sea. Those ten days at sea were dreadful. And some, including our Martel Malinke, became deathly ill. She died soon after the liberation. We were more dead than alive. We weren't people and didn't look like them either. On May 5th, 300 prisoners, 15 of them witnesses, landed on an island off the coast of Denmark. Danish witnesses heard the news and rushed to meet them. When we realized that these were our brothers and sisters and that we knew what they had been through in the concentration camps, the treatment they had been so off, we knew all about these things. But this was the first time that we met somebody that had been in a concentration camp. You can imagine the impression. So after some talking, I was finally permitted to go on board. Yes, I must say it was a great shock for me to see them. I shall never forget how these walking skeletons embraced me out of sheer joy. We were suffering from typhoid. We had lies. They put their arms around us. They... It was an unforgettable experience, even for these sisters. The SS at Wevelsburg planned to kill all 42 witness prisoners before abandoning the camp. Why? The witnesses knew where the SS had hidden stolen art treasures, plundered from across Europe. In the frantic final days, four execution attempts failed. We were to be taken through the forest, which was close by, away from the front, and then we were to run into machine gun fire from the SS to give the impression that we had run into the front lines of the Americans. Suddenly, the Allied troops bombarded Wevelsburg. The guards scattered. Mox and ten other prisoners ran for cover in the north tower of the castle. Ironically, it was the very place that Himmler envisioned as the center for SS cult worship. In this shaft, we hid ourselves, and the wall, three meters thick, protected us. We waited until darkness. The SS had disappeared and we were free. And we were free. Adolf Hitler had often stood as a guard before a vast sea of troops in Nuremberg at the Zeppelin Meadow. But now it was the witnesses who assembled on these very same grounds and Adolf Hitler was gone. The unity among the sisters and the brothers, that gave us so much strength. It was our aim to endure under all circumstances. We never prayed to be set free. We prayed for strength to endure. Everything else was unimportant. What mattered was standing up for Jehovah's name. Franz Wolfhardt expected to be executed like his father and brother before him. Thinking of his mother, his bride-to-be and his fellow witnesses, he wrote his farewell poem in 1944 while captive in a Nazi camp. In my faith I will always stand firm, though this world may taunt and cry. In my hope I will always stand firm, for a beautiful, better time. 
in my love I will always stand firm, though this world repays with hate. Devoted, I will always stand firm, though this world disloyal stays. From God's word flows the might of the strong, and the weak ones it powerful makes. In God's grace I will always stand firm, on my own I could never remain. With my life I will even stand firm, and as I my last breath confer, you should with that dying gasp hear, I stand firm, I stand firm, I stand firm. I stand firm. These words echo the determination of the thousands of witnesses, living and dead, who stood firm against Nazi assault.